Parvo, distemper, rabies, canine influenza. The internet is polluted with strong opinions about vaccines. Today on the show, a nuanced look at vaccines for your dog. Are we vaccinating our pets too often? How would we know? And what can we do to make sure our dogs are fully protected? Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Vaccinations, especially human ones, have somehow grown into a controversial topic (laughs) over the last couple of years. But we here at DPN believe vaccines are safe and effective. But are we vaccinating our pets too often, or are we risking disastrous consequences by vaccinating a puppy too early? Today on the show, we dive into the latest knowledge on immunity and pet health, that and a lot more on today's episode. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, And let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? Keeping our dogs healthy requires keeping them up to date on their vaccinations. But there are lots of them, and so many boosters that seem to come around very quickly. Dr. Enid Stiles is one of the North American counselors for the World Vet Association. She says that for an adult dog, the core group of vaccines that covers adeno, distemper, and parvo, those are recommended once every three years. When you look at the vaccines themselves and the studies that have been done on those vaccines in order to label them, you will see that they all have three-year labels now for well-vaccinated animals. Of course, puppies, like children, need much more frequent vaccinations to build up their immunity. We have a regimen typically once every two to four weeks as puppies for upwards of four vaccine boosters. And then we will typically give another booster at about a year of age, so about 12 months later. So how do you know when to vaccinate? Based on dog owners we spoke to in dog parks, it seems most people leave it to their vet to make sure that their dogs get their vaccines and boosters on time. Any vet worth their salt will let you know when it's time uh, for a booster. My vet, fortunately, sends out a reminder to me that he needs to be updated on all of his shots. So I keep a, they basically track it. Um, I also try and keep all of my pets on the same basic schedule. So I know if it's come up one time for one, then it'll come up for time for the others as well. I have a folder in my drawer at work. And plus, any any good vet's going to send you a reminder because... That's how they get paid. (laughs) (laughs) That is how they get paid. And that's where I get these little postcards written to my dog every now and then reminding me it's time for your vaccination. You should tell Jim. Those dog owners at the park sounded like they were doing the responsible thing. The problem is that even if you keep your puppy up to date on their shots, they may not be protected. Vaccination and immunization are two different things, right? Vaccination is we give a vaccine. Immunization is when the dog actually responds to the vaccine that we gave. That is Dr. Laurie Larson. She is the director of the Companion Animal Vaccines and Immunodiagnostic Service Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin's School of Veterinary Medicine. What Dr. Larson does is something called titer testing. Basically, what we're doing is taking the serum sample from your dog or your cat and then combining it with the virus that we are looking for to see if the antibody in that sample can block that virus from doing what it wants to do. Serum is the part of the blood that remains after it clots. In the end, the test results can tell whether an animal is protected from the virus or whether the pet needs to receive another shot. Dr. Larson says that making sure the vaccines are generating immunization is particularly important for puppies because of something called derived immunity. That is the number one cause for vaccine failure to immunize in the puppy is that the maternal antibody that they got at birth blocks the vaccine. 
Our modified live viral vaccines, the, all of those core ones, have to infect in order to do their job. If antibody blocks it, the vaccine can't do its job. And so with our puppies, they get antibody from the mother through the classroom, and then that degrades over time. And it needs to get below a certain level before our vaccine can get through, infect, and immunize. That is so interesting. So when the puppies are born, they get some antibodies from the mother, which protects them initially from diseases. But then that same protection can kind of kill off the live element in the vaccines and prevent them from working and giving the long term immunisation to the puppies that they need. Sometimes we don't catch those. And those are the ones that then are susceptible to parvo when they get to be six months of age. Dr. Larson says that derived immunity can block vaccines for as long as 20 weeks or more in certain puppies. And running a titer test two weeks after the initial vaccine series, well, that can let owners know where their puppy stands. The CAVIDS lab at the University of Wisconsin also offers a service for breeders called the Nomograph. We check mother dogs for their antibodies against distemper and parvo. And then we calculate how much are the puppies in the litter going to get from the mom at birth. Once the lab has calculated how many antibodies the litter is likely to get, she can figure out how long derived immunity should last for those puppies. And that allows her to create a custom vaccination schedule for the litter. If they're immune at 12 weeks, that socialization period, you know, where they go to puppy kindergarten and they learn about how to be a good dog, they can do all of that with confidence because they know their dog's protected. For a lot of people, you're like walking on eggshells with your puppy until you get that last dose at 16 weeks if you're using the standard schedule. With the nomograph, sometimes you can finish earlier, and I think that's great. Finishing early, that does sound great. So one puppy could theoretically be fully immunized at 12 weeks, but another could still have derived immunity at 20 weeks. That's an eight-week difference, and that is huge when it comes to a puppy. Right, and that second puppy would then just be starting its shots and wouldn't be fully immunised until sometime after that. But running a titer test would be the only way to know it worked. Titer tests are really wonderful. I was surprised to find out that they have been around since the late 1950s. That's amazing, isn't it? Dr Larson herself has been doing them for 30 years, but she says they're becoming more and more mainstream. There are limits to what a titer test can do. They can only be done for certain vaccines. There are a lot of other vaccines that we can't do this for. Lyme vaccine, lepto vaccine. But it's a real blessing that we can do this test for the, the most serious, deadly of the viruses that are out there for the dog and cat. After the break, more applications for titer tests. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff, traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpup. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. 
Welcome back. Before the break, we were discussing titer testing to make sure that puppies get enough vaccines to be protected from disease. But titer tests can also work to protect dogs from getting too many vaccines. Here's a veterinarian with a slightly different perspective on vaccines, Dr. Jacqueline Ruskin. My thoughts on vaccines are I I do feel that there is a place for them. I feel that training the immune system to anticipate a, an attack is an uh, appropriate thing to do. But I feel in veterinary medicine that they're overused and also used at too high of a dose. And Dr. Ruskin also says that one of the things we have to be concerned about is that some dogs can have adverse reactions to vaccines. There is the immediate possibilities of you know, anaphylaxis, an extreme allergic reaction can happen. And then you can have sort of minor versions of that with vomiting and diarrhea that occurs as part of a vaccine reaction. But then we have these delayed hypersensitivity reactions that are different in that they come later, you know, after the vaccine, where it's a little bit harder to tie it to the actual vaccine. Now, Jim, you have a bit of personal experience with this. I do. Uh, Years ago, when I was moving to Hawaii, I had a Maltese named Maui who needed to get up on her rabies vaccines. And so we did a lot of blood titers. And they weren't at the level that the state of Hawaii at that point Mm. mandated. So what the vet did in Colorado is just gave her more. And so a lot of vaccine for rabies Mm -hmm. was given Mm -hmm. in a relatively, in a small dog in a relatively short period of time. And what was unusual, and I don't know for sure if this was connected, but when we moved to Hawaii a few weeks later, my dog had lost her eyesight all of a sudden very quickly oh. through this really rare disease that some veterinarians have suggested may have been caused by having too much of the rabies vaccine in her body. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you should mention rabies because it is one that we have to keep on top of with our dog mm-hmm. because we can move at any point. And so we have to make sure she's she's vaccinated all the time. And it's based on nothing it does make me nervous because i know it's it's quite a strong vaccine and so funnily enough i i I had ours just literally about two weeks ago so i'm glad you're telling me this story now (laughs) i mean no one in veterinary science can say this causes this but there is an interesting coincidence if you will yeah absolutely dr enid styles agrees that dogs can have adverse reactions to vaccines Adverse reactions are one very serious thing, and and they can happen to any dog at any time at any vaccine. Now, that said, Dr. Enid Stiles says that there is no evidence of any harm being done to dogs when they are vaccinated more than is normally recommended. I certainly believe that the risk of these diseases far outweighs the very minimal likelihood of both adverse reactions and these other more chronic and more significant disease processes that may or may not be linked to vaccines. So you might be wondering why a vet would give a vaccine more often than recommended. Dr. Stiles says that a vet may not have access to a dog's vaccination records. There are many dogs out there who, you know, have changed families and we don't have histories of their vaccines and we give them a vaccine that maybe they already had many times before and might be, you know, not needing to be given. And they're perfectly fine when we do so. Dr. Jacqueline Ruskin says some veterinary clinics require dogs to be up to date on their vaccinations in order to be admitted. Say a patient comes in for vomiting and diarrhea and they need to be admitted for IV fluids, you know, treatment in the hospital. Those patients, if they're not up to date on vaccination, some veterinary hospitals require those vaccinations to be updated in order to admit the patient into the hospital. So the problem with this is that it, number one, you have a patient who's already immune compromised by the disease that they're coming in for. And the other issue is the vaccines are labeled for use in healthy pets only. If you look at the label, that's exactly what it says for use in healthy pets only. And so essentially they're using the product off the label and they're potentially putting the patient in harm's way. 
And that's not all. Dr. Ruskin says some vets recommend yearly vaccines for adult dog patients, despite the once every three year recommendation from places like the World's Small Animal Veterinary Association and the American Animal Hospital Association. Sometimes it's just a veterinarian that's that's the way they've done it for 30 years. And so they continue to do things as the way that they've been doing them. Some veterinarians truly believe that the vaccine is needed yearly. They believe that if they don't give that vaccine yearly, they will uh, put the, the patient at risk. And the other reason that they're doing that is to, as an incentive for people to come in for an annual exam, because they think that if they don't require that vaccine yearly, they won't see that patient yearly, and therefore the patient won't get an annual exam. And hence those postcards in the mail. Anyway, there is a lot to unpack there. And to do that, let's talk with Dr. Stiles, who says that up until about 15 years ago, all vaccines were given annually. So maybe those vets who have been doing it the old way for you know 30 years or whatever are not up to date on the current recommendations. But as far as using vaccines to get patients into the door for a yearly exam? When we started to move from yearly everything to spreading things out, we had labeled um, vaccines for three years. That was a consistent comment, I would say. People were very worried. Vets were very worried they were not going to see their patients to do their annual exams. And in fact, we all know that that is probably our priority is to do a wellness and a full physical exam on these pets yearly. But I think that those have very much lessened that concern. Most of our new graduates do not have this opinion. They want to see the science, and so do we. And I think also that, you know, we're much better now at communicating why we're doing physical exams on your pet yearly. What's the importance of that? Like the old saying goes, one year for a dog is like seven years for a human. And that would be a very long time without seeing a doctor. Now, there may be some occasional reasons to administer vaccines more frequently. Here's Dr. Stiles. That if we're dealing with dogs who are living in shelters, whereby they are frequently coming into contact with parvo and distemper, the frequency of the vaccines may be more frequent. Titer testing takes the guesswork out of the equation. Dr. Larson at Cavid's lab says that there is no need to vaccinate a dog if you know that they are still immunized. There's no benefit if the animal is already immune. However, any time we administer a vaccine, there's a chance for an adverse reaction. Ordering a titer test can reduce the amount of vaccines that you give your dog, thereby reducing the risks of adverse reactions. Dr. Starr says she sometimes does core vaccine titer tests for animals that have immune-mediated diseases and really need to restrict the number of vaccines they get. But she thinks the result is of limited use. It's not really giving me a lot of information about what that animal is going to do if it gets an infection. So I'm very wary to say that in that moment in time, that gives me that information, but six months down the road when the dog comes into contact with that disease, we may or may not have a good enough response. Dr. Larson says that core titer tests should be done every year and that it's all about risk reduction. We have the risk of disease, we have the benefit of the vaccine, and we have the risk of the vaccine. And it all goes together. But the thing is, we really, all of us, everybody, wants our dogs to be immune and protected against these viruses. One thing to note here is that a titer test is about $100 more expensive than giving a vaccine. So running a titer test every year would add up on top of all the other costs for routine veterinary care. So far, we've talked about titer testing for the core vaccines, adeno, distemper and parvo. But there's also a titer test for rabies. Rabies is a very different thing because they've had so much research done. It's a far better type of titer to be given for its purposes. Although Dr. Ruskin says that titer testing is barely recognised by state governments in the US. Delaware is the only state that will accept a rabies titer as a form of proof of satisfying the state law requirement for rabies. Every other state requires the actual vaccine be given Delaware's Maggie Vaccine Protection Act says exemption from rabies vaccine may be permitted if a licensed veterinarian examined the animal and determined that vaccination would endanger the animal's health 
because of its age, infirmity, disability, illness, or other medical consideration. The language in the bill is actually a little vague on titers. It says that a titer test may be administered to assist in determining the need for vaccination, and that was signed into law in July of 2020. The bill was named after the late shih tzu of a Delaware restaurateur, Maggie. The state laws are behind where science is. Anything in medicine is always hard to shift. Anything that's been routine, general day-to-day care in veterinary medicine and really human medicine, things shift very slowly. Dr. Larson says the restrictions on rabies are stricter because it is a public health risk to humans. The thing with rabies is that there are a lot of legal constraints on us veterinarians. We vaccinate dogs against rabies as much to protect humans as we do to protect the animals we're vaccinating. She says she knows there are groups trying to change the laws so that the tighter tests for rabies can be provided in lieu of vaccination. It's going to take a really big effort on the part, actually, of the vaccine makers I think, to be able to make that happen because they'll need to prove their own vaccines can provide a certain amount of immunity and then do the challenge studies. And those studies are very difficult to do. In the meantime, talk to your vet about tailoring vaccine recommendations to your dog's lifestyle. Here's Dr. Ruskin. Are they on a farm where they're, they might be exposed to these things? Are they going to daycare where they, they could be exposed to more diseases? Or are they sitting in a New York City apartment and just weeing on weeby pads and never seeing anybody? Dr. Ruskin says vaccines are often given to dogs that don't need them. A patient in New York City or a city, they're often getting vaccines for things like Lyme disease. They never go outside. They're still being given vaccines for things like Bordetella and canine flu and even Distepper Parvo when they have really no exposure to other dogs. And ask about getting a tighter test the next time your dogs are up for a booster shot. And that is all we have time for on our nuanced conversation about vaccines. We'd love to hear what you think. Please join us on our website at dogedition.com and please tell a friend about Dog Edition. And to make sure you get the next episode of Dog Edition as soon as it drops, make sure you follow us in your podcast app. You can get more information about this show at dogedition.com and you can also get in touch with us there and tell us what you would like to hear on the podcast. We would love to hear from you. I'm Claire Mansell. And I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.